Hi everybody, I'm John Iverson, I'm a national columnist for the National Post and we three are going to try and have some fun on a weekly video series discussing the political events of the prior week. I'm joined by Andrew Balfour who is managing partner of Rubicon Strategies and will soon be seen on a patio near you if you live in Ottawa and by Marcella Munro who is the owner operator of WPM Public Affairs and who described herself as never having been insulted at being called a champagne socialist which gives a sense of her political leanings. She also considers herself a rebel and a princess. And on that note, I wonder what you thought of poor old Megan this week, another of your Ugh. fellow princesses. Oh my God. What a mess, what a mess. Um, you know, the racism is horrible, obviously, but do we expect anything else from the royal family? And it, it harkens back to so my, my, my dad's parents. Uh, my grandfather was a Scottish, you know, poor Scottish farmer, and he married an English woman who's descended of the Tudors. So I think in that house it would have gone something like, what do you expect from the Windsors, and what do you expect from the Windsors? Like, I don't think anyone, you know, this family is hugely problematic, not just structurally, but I think lineage-wise, and it shouldn't shock anyone, but it was also a bit, you know, it's a bit much, I think, during International Women's Week when women are being, like, literally in the Western world anyway, you know, unemployment, poverty and everything rising uh, during COVID and, you know, listening to her talk about her woes, I don't know. I, I, I kind of had to turn it off at some point. Andrew, you're probably an ardent royalist, aren't you? Uh, no, I, I mean, the only thing I'm curious about is how much money they're getting paid by Oprah out of the whole thing. Yeah. Otherwise, well, my, I didn't watch it, so I don't really care. My uh, sense of the royal family was... I was in full agreement with the socialist worker when Charles married Diana and the headline in the socialist worker was Parasite Marries Scrounger. <laughs> Some, somebody with a sense of humour at the post uh, assigned me at one point to go and cover the royal tour when Will and, Wills and Kate came, which was fun. I, uh, I, the rebel and princess thing comes from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away where uh, I had to debate Ezra Levant on TV. Oh. Uh, Did he sue you? Uh, no, no. He subsequently harassed me a lot when I was in Alberta. But uh, but yeah, so that line comes from there because he was like, it's too contradictory. And I said, well, I don't see what's wrong with being both a rebel and a princess. So. On that note, so to business. Let's talk about the prospect for a general election. When do you think we're going to see Canadians go to the polls, Marcella? I, you know, if you'd asked me that three weeks ago, I probably would have said, you know, not until early summer. But to be honest, I think like a lot of people, I've been a bit surprised with how quickly now it feels like the vaccines are starting to roll out. And I had this pet theory that Trudeau was like waiting for a moment where the only problems in the system are now being caused by the provincial governments, many of whom can't stand him. And so he just decides to pull the plug and let them wear that and go to the polls. Because, you know, we, we've also, incumbents are doing a pretty... Incumbents are, are having a neat trade right now with getting elected during this crisis. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's earlier. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess end of May, something like that. Andrew? I think it's a little difficult to, for them to plan for it when the vaccine schedules are so uncertain. I mean, you could easily plan to call one in August and have it in September, and it would be easy. But into Marcello's point about letting the provinces wear it, I still don't think that your average Canadian understands that the provinces are responsible for the rollout. I think that, you know, Justin Trudeau still would take some blame if you could, you know, and if you, given that your average conservative voter is more apt to show up, they would drag their naked body through the snow to go vote for whatever person's name was on the ballot. Uh, if you did a July or an August election, I think it would be tough for turnout numbers for the Liberals because their voters aren't as motivated. So, I mean... Yeah, I mean, we're going to have a budget probably April. And then a lot of the CERB or the Canada revenue benefit spending comes off in September. You don't want to have an election after you've taken money away from people. So I think, you know, some sometime between a budget and end of September. What if you called an election in August for the second week of September? People have been able to go on summer holiday. You make it so the month of August that uh, Jugmeet and Aaron O'Toole have no ability to connect with Canadians because they're not paying attention to the news. They come back, their kids are back in school, they're vaccinated. There's a two-week news cycle before an election that Trudeau can still dominate, and then it's over and he comes back with a majority. 
I agree with that scenario. Marcella, just to, Andrew brought up Judmeet. He is routinely the most popular of the leaders. I mean, it, it's not unknown for, for that to translate into votes. Do you think that could happen? <laughs> well, you know, I think it's easy for him to be popular as a leader because no one thinks he's going to be prime minister. I mean, I'll just be very blunt about that. Um, you know, I think he's had a good few months. I think it doesn't hurt that the Liberals are moving in a direction that he can support and keep adding things to. And the Liberals have kind of been forced to a situation where they have to think really long and hard before turning him down. But, um, you know, we know the game plan. Like, this isn't rocket science, right? The Liberals like to see a bit of a puffier number around the NDP pre-election because that opens up the targeting for how they're going to try and collapse that number when they need to. He does have a bunch of problems, by the way. Like, I feel like right now, like, they, the NDP may become an even... They keep becoming more and more urbanized. Back when I was a little girl, lots of... That's how I became a new Democrat. Working class families didn't have a problem voting for them. They thought that was part of the deal. And I think nowadays, I don't think that's the case. I think the conservatives know that, and they're moving into some of that space. So he could lose seats. He could lose some seats that, you know, just the vote split doesn't work, and he's gaining votes in urban areas and losing them in rural just bring it up, O'Toole, I was tickled today, poor old Aaron O'Toole, he, uh, he talked to his caucus and said he, that uh, they shouldn't air their frustration in the media, and then a source told the National Post that, so clearly his caucus is not, is not listening to him. Um, will he even make it to an election, Andrew? Oh, he'll make it to an election, but I mean, what happens next weekend with this train wreck of a convention where they can't even have the chairman of the most powerful fundraising arm in Canadian history elected as a delegate to their own convention is pretty Now, to be, to be fair, he, he, he me? withdrew his name. I that. The, the chair of the Conservative Fund. But, but there are other prominent Conservatives who did want to go, including Stephen Lecce, who's a minister in Ontario, and, and it looks like the delegate lists are being stacked, right? Right. But, I mean, if Aaron O'Toole, like, gets outfoxed by someone like Derek Sloan at his own convention when he controls the levers of the party, he deserves it. Right. What do you think, Marcella? I think he's just... I, I, so the, the leaks aside, which has been quite entertaining for obvious reasons, um, I'm just surprised how he's kind of getting it from all sides so quickly. You know? They haven't even taken the car around the block and people are trying to take the wheels off it. Like, it's just a bit weird that it's so... But he's had, he's had no bump, uh, no honeymoon period, and his numbers among women are Atrocious. worse than any leader, that, worse than Andrew Shears, which... He's going to be... I mean, Susan Delacour wrote about this last week. Like, it's not a uh, foreign concept to think that Aaron O'Toole could be their version of Michael Ignatieff. Like, he could come back and do worse than Shear did. Right? I think the other thing is, to that point about women voters, though, like... You know, and I, I'm a broken record for saying this because people, Andrew will know this, but lots of people don't realize when we talk about swing seats, like a lot of the swing votes happen to be women in the suburbs, right? And so, you know, now we're seeing this huge she session and women have been super pounded by this pandemic. So if I'm the conservatives, the last thing I want to do is go in with a leader who also doesn't happen to be, you know, favorable for women who are worried about economic recovery. Like that's just like the worst case scenario. I feel bad for the conservatives. I remember the good old days in university when, you know, those conventions were just about getting drunk. <laughs> well, nobody's getting drunk this time unless they're doing it on their own dime at home, like we are. So, <laughs> cheers. On that cheers. note, I think we sounds like we're all agreed that um, uh, it's going to be a Justin Trudeau juggernaut. Although I do remember that phrase being used about Paul Martin and it didn't quite work out. <laughs> didn't work out. I covered that campaign too. That was nasty. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for coming on and we'll do it all over again in seven days. Bye.